Well, good morning, friends. This is Dan Roke with the media team welcoming you to French Church Online. As always, I'm excited to be here. I'm especially excited to welcome you uh, if you're new to French Church. We have a great uh, lineup today for worship, uh, which we're just about to head into. But what I want to do before that is, is if you can do me this favor, can you go to our website, chfriends.church, click on the I'm New tab, scroll to the bottom, click on the uh, the connection card, fill out some basic information, submit it back to us, and we will follow up with you uh, and answer any questions that you might have about friends. Uh, it's a great way for us at Friends to to uh, to get to know you and for you to get to know us and ultimately get to know uh, get to know our God, become closer with God, and, and start building that relationship with God through friends. And and uh, as always, we we are we are here to help. We are here to to engage with you. We do have a chat set up in our in our online service with volunteers that are ready to to pray with you, to to answer any questions you may have about service. So please, if you can, utilize that chat and uh, someone will be there to to, uh, to connect and engage with you. Well, that's about all I have. Uh, I don't wanna take up too much time. I do wanna head into our service. I just wanna say God bless you today and thank you for being with us. Let's head on in.
tongue Focus my heart to hear Settle my pace Purge me a pride
just want to pray for us as we begin today. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for each and every person that is, that is here, that is watching, that is listening. Lord, I just pray for your encouragement and your hope. I pray that you would take captive our thoughts, Lord, that you would, um, uh, at least for right now, uh, take the cares and the burdens that we're, we're walking around with that are almost overwhelming, Lord, and just take those from us. Encourage us and build us up. Lord, I pray for uh, each home and each family that is represented, that your hand would be upon us, protect us. Reveal yourself to us in a greater and greater way uh, through this series and in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, I'm, I started out with prayer because I just feel like I have so much to say today and I want to get through it. We started last week in our series in the book of Genesis called In the Beginning, and we got to how many verses? One. Genesis chapter one, verse one. In the beginning was God and God was before everything. God was before everything, before science, before philosophy, before religion, before matter existed, before this planet, before our time, before everything. He is one God. Uh, he is the creator of all things. The Bible uses the word Elohim, which, which means the God of all creation. And our main conclusion last week was... Uh, from Revelation chapter 14, verse 7, near the end of the Bible, we're starting at the beginning of the Bible, near the end of the Bible, it says, worship him who made the heavens and the earth. It's all about God and his nature and his, his actions and activities. It's a foundation for all of life and all of existence. And um, in all the end, the main goal is for us to worship God. And, and so... Uh, uh, online in the devotions, if you've participated in that, I encourage you to join our, our uh, Facebook uh, group. Um, there's a link in the chat so you can, you can do that. But I have daily devotions to uh, help walk us through this. And, and I I've outlined the seven days of creation and made some observations. And so uh, today we're going to pick up in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, and we're going to go through chapter 2 verse 4. Um, we're going to look today at the making of man. Uh, are people created by God or evolved by nature is our big question. And so we're going to learn today that not only is God the God of creation, the Elohim, he is also, in, in reference to us, he's Yahweh. He is Jehovah, God in relationship to man. And so when you read Genesis, and I hope you're reading through this, I hope it's generating lots of questions. I hope you're studying on your own. Um, you might uh, see this, this uh, big thing of, of creation in chapter one, and then it seems like it repeats it in chapter two. Um, but uh, one is the broad view of creation, how cosmologically God pulled it together. The second one uh, is, is how uh, from a kind of a human viewpoint, um, just like we talked about last week, that creation, there's two words for created or creation. And uh, the first one is bara, which means created from nothing, out of nothing, ex nihilo. Um, and the other word is asa, which is you take things that exist and you can create things out of something that already exists. And so you'll see, uh, as, as we look later in the creation of man, you'll see um, more forming and shaping together of things and pulling things together. And you'll see like in the garden speaking uh, into existence versus uh, planting and preparing the garden. So before I get into this, though, I want to mention something that I think may have brought up in your consideration. That is this idea of literal and metaphor or symbolism. And so how do we read Genesis? How do we read some of these things? Like, um, uh, uh, do we read it figuratively or literally? So here's the big question. Were the seven days of creation literal 24-hour periods? So here's the, here, first of all, let me, let me just say, yes, I believe personally they were. I don't think that is, is a closed handed issue that if you don't believe it was 24 hours, then you're not a Christian and you're not, you know, truly one of the elite or anything like that. But, um, 
I, I want to also point out that that just being literal is not the goal of understanding Scripture. Um, in fact, we get the idea that if we're more literal, the most literal we can get with Scripture, the better. That's wrong thinking. Because um, when we read the Bible and think literal, literally uh, originally meant as the author intended. But now it's come out in, in this idea of, of you know, how, how as, as plain as it reads in the English language, that's how we should interpret it. And, and let me give you an example of this, is, is this idea of the flat earth. There are a number of people who are flat earthers. These are people that look at some of the scriptures and the way God describes the earth and the creation and these kinds of things. And they get this symbolism and these, these metaphors and, and figures of, of the earth that's described in scripture. And they start taking those literally and it messes them up. For instance, a number of places in scripture, it talks about... Uh, the four corners of the earth. We know that's an idiom. We know that means all or, you know, all the aspects of it. But uh, flat earth earthers take that literally. Let me give you an example of how to determine between literal and figurative in, in understanding a verse. Let me uh, talk about Matthew chapter 23, verse 33. Jesus says, you snakes, um, you brood of vipers to Pharisees. He says those words. Now, how are we to interpret that? Um, first of all, uh, in, in our approach to scripture, we need to say that was a literal event. That wasn't some kind of parable. It wasn't a made up story. Jesus literally, it was a literal event where he talked to people and he said those literal words. Um, however, he used metaphorical language. Uh, so it was a real literal event. He said those literal words, but we can't assume that he's talking to snakes and vipers. He was using figurative language, language there. So we need to understand when the Bible talks about things like sin, it's literal. It's not figurative. Um, when he's using idioms and various things like that, we, we understand it figuratively. So that's why we struggle sometimes in these, these things, because we have all this knowledge about science and we're going, well, what is the, how does that all fit? Is this literal? Is it figurative? What are we supposed to believe? And those, that's a good question. Uh, but understand, you take the whole counsel of God in, in heart and mind also. Proverbs 8, verse 27 also says, when he inscribed a circle on the face of the deep or, or the arc of the horizon. So, so even in scripture, it talks about what, when people still believed in, they didn't know what the planet was or this, that this was a planet, that they, the, there was an arc on the horizon. There was always, you could sail towards the horizon and it always seemed uh, farther away. So either way, we need to be careful about getting silly interpretations of, of the Bible based on a purely literal understanding of it. Um, we don't need to do that because we know that the world is trying to thwart the truth of God. And so we just need to be uh, understand that this is revelation from God and we need to follow it when it's literal as literal, when it's figurative as figurative, whatever kind of language and context that it's in. So we see the scripture as our authority, as our final authority. We don't believe that there are heirs in scripture, you know, and, and so, uh, but just as in Jesus's day, the religious people had this, this idea of, oh, we've got to understand the law and therefore be so rigid on it. And Jesus said this in John chapter five, he said, you study the scriptures diligently because you think in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. See, the context of scripture, the ultimate end of all things revealed in scripture is the context of relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And so that is the utmost context. And so we need to understand what he's uh, God's trying to say in scripture. So we don't miss him. We can get so caught up into the details and the minutia that we miss out.
Okay, so let's get into today's topic and, and uh, let's jump in. How many of you have kids? Yeah, you have kids. And, and what happens when you find out you're pregnant or you're, you're getting ready to, to have your, your first child or whatever? Um, you prepare. You prepare for when the baby comes. And so what do you do? You change everything in your house. You, um, you need a nursery. You need a bassinet. Uh, you need a car seat. You need to get rid of everything sharp. And and uh, when they start to walk, uh, you need to cover up all the outlets. We need to prepare the environment for a uh, a child. And so God is like a father. He is like a parent who is preparing a human environment of this earth for us. His his this earth was created um, as a place for his created people, human beings to live and to, to abide. And so, uh, God made the world by getting it ready for us. And so this week we're going to look at how God created human life and he put it on the planet. Now, most of us grew up in this culture nowadays that is extremely, uh, inundated and indoctrinating in terms of atheistic, naturalistic evolution. Um, that basically there is no God. We've dispro- we've done away with the God stuff already. You know, we've had uh, ninth grade biology. We just know evolution is a fact. There's nothing beyond this world. And so there's no spiritual element to the world. There's no such thing as a th- soul. There is no God. And... Uh, That kind of thinking contradicts what the Bible actually says. Let me, as I get into this, make a couple preliminary points. That is, first of all, there is a conflict between Christianity and atheistic evolution. And that is the conflict that I just mentioned. You know, God can can choose to use evolutionary process um, to, to create mankind and you can believe that and understand that and still and love the Lord. But um, the, uh, what I'm talking about here in terms of the atheistic evolution is that uh, there's an unwillingness to recognize that there's anything beyond the physical world, that everything is naturalistic. Um, see, the Bible says there's something beyond this physical world. There was something before this physical world. God is and angels and that man has a spirit, a soul inside of them. And uh, so there's more to, to this world than just this physical world. There's also a spiritual world. So there is a little bit of a conflict there. Number two, Bible is mainly a theological book about a relationship with God. It's not a science textbook. It's not going to contradict science, though, um, uh, unless it's saying something in in a uh, figurative or idiom. For instance, in Revelation, it talks about these crazy beasts and creatures, uh, which we could probably look at now and go, oh, that's a helicopter. That's an Apache helicopter, uh, the way it's described. Or this this to happen, that's that's nuclear uh, bomb. You know, so so it's not contradicting. It's just put in language that uh, that's the only language they had that God utilized at that time for them. So anyway, um, Galileo, who was a Christian, he said it like this. The Holy Ghost intended to teach us how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. So God's intention is not to describe all the details of how it all works together, but how we have relationship with God that God did. So that's how I'm approaching this study in Genesis is, is getting the key elements of what we really have to understand that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Um, and today we're going to go uh, deeper into that and talk about uh, the questions of mankind and, and what does God have to say about that? Number three, there is no conflict between good science and Christianity. Um, don't buy into the lies. Uh, if you are a Christian, you're not anti-science um, because God made the world in an orderly way. We can examine it. There are natural laws. We can experiment. We can observe. I can boil water um, in one room of my house at, at this temperature and I can boil it in another room and I'm going to, I can do it one day and then boil it the next day and it's going to be the same temperature right? 
Um, but at the same time, if I boiled water down here at my house at a certain elevation, and then I went up to Lake Tahoe up into the mountains and I tried to boil water there, did you know that atmospheric pressure Im impacts the, the, the uh, temperature of the boil? So it's 212 degrees here in, you know, sea level kind of thing. You go up 5,000 feet and it's 209 degrees Fahrenheit is where water will boil. See, those are observable things. That's God designed it that way. It's just so amazing that our world is, is like this. And so um, God is faithful to his creation. And so if you're into medicine, if you're into the hard sciences, if you're an engineer, you know, you can love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. You can use your mind. You don't, you don't have to be worried about your faith because your mind, um, God knows it. So Hugh Ross is a uh, uh, astronomy PhD and he found God through a telescope. At the age of 17, he was the youngest director uh, at Vancouver's Royal Astronomical Society. At 17, he takes the telescope and he's, he's looking up into space and, and he's look, thinking about the world and its space's impact on the, uh, his faith. And he came to faith in Jesus Christ and trusting and reliance on the Bible. And he says this, he says, the more you investigate the great planet that which is be and that which is beyond it, the greatness of God becomes self-evident. There was another man named Francis Collins. I've quoted him before, but he met God. Uh, he met the Lord Jesus Christ through not through a telescope, but through a microscope. And uh, he is or was the head of the Human Genome Project, uh, studying genetics at the uh, National Institute, or he is now the National Institute of Health Director, uh, working with Fauci on, on COVID and all that kind of stuff. He became a Christian through his study of the human genome. He wrote a book about it called The Language of God, and he says this. He says, when you look at the perspective of a scientist at the universe, it looks as if it knew we were coming. There are 15 constants constants, the gravitational constant, various constants about the strong and weak nuclear forces, etc., that have precise values. If any one of those constants was off by even one part in a million, or in some cases, one part in a million million, the universe could not have actually come to the point where we see it now. Matter would not have been able to coalesce there would have been no galaxy, stars, planets, or people. See, what he says as a scientist is this, is, is you can look at the statistic probability of human life and you have to conclude for this environment to exist in this unique place, it requires an architect. It requires acknowledgement that God is a designer, that he brought all this thing, these things together. And so that's what we're going to begin today in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26. And you're saying, finally, you get to the passage we're going to look at. Yeah, I'm sorry. I got a lot to say. But anyway, uh, the first point I want to make is God made, made us. It says this, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the seas and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and over the wild animals and over all creatures that move along the ground. God made us. Now, I talked last week about the use of the word let us make mankind in our image because God exists as a triune God, three, pers three persons of the Trinity, one God. I won't go into that again, but um, God made us. God made you. You are no accident. You are not here because of chance or, or mutation. You are God's handiwork. That's an amazing point that we need to understand. We need to see it ourselves. We need to know that you and I are God's work. We need to see it in others. We need to see other people in the world um, the way God sees us, that we are his handiwork. And if we do, then we treat each other in light of that. Those are the people that God made. Um, God made them. 
And because God made them, they have dignity, they have value, they have worth. And if he made them in his image and his likeness, uh, then we should treat them with dignity and value and worth, right? We, we, in, in a world that's accidentally uh, come upon, why do we have to treat others with dignity and value and worth? Really none. If, if this is all about survival of the fittest, then so be it. See, but that's not what people want. That's not what people believe. They, oh, well, we've got to treat each other well. Well, why? See, that comes from understanding we were created by God in his image, and his image is what we uh, live out. So um, God made you. Here's the big idea. Atheism, atheism says that we made God. Uh, Ludwig uh, Feuerbach in 19th century said this. He said, God is not a person, but it's a concept, a concept that humans made. See, atheism believes that God is a made up idea. Uh, Karl Marx, a uh, favorite of today, he said, politically, we made God so that the state can control people. And politically, Marxist countries like to get rid of God so that their government can control people. And that's why their intentions are made more clearly in, in understanding that than the existence of God or not. Um, Sigmund Freud said, Psycholo psychologically, we created God because of deep brokenness. Brokenness from what? Where? Where did this brokenness come from? Frederick Nietzsche, uh, an atheist, well-known atheist, uh, said this, we created God philosophically as a crutch. So all these, you know, big minds in the past that tried to eliminate God through their, their, um, their science, their, their thing. It's interesting because Nietzsche went insane at the end of his life. And guess when he lost his mind, who took care of him? His mother, his Christian mother, uh, cared for him and tended to him because she believed the teachings of the Bible that God created humans and that they are worthwhile and they are valuable. And that's how we treat people. See, the point is we didn't make God. God made us. God made us. And he's personal and he's, he's loving. See, um, we've got to know that God created us so that we know what it means to be human. So we know what it means to live this life. If we think we're just an accident, no wonder there's such rampant depression, such uh, confusion and animalistic behavior towards one another. Um, and and uh, so who am I? You know, being human is something very important. But here's the thing. When we try to live as a human without God, with God who gives us identity and, and purpose, uh, we have ourselves as our only reference point. And so do, what do we have? We have self-esteem. We have self-image. We have self-love. We have self-help. And so there's no reference to God in a, in a atheistic, um, uh, naturalistic kind of understanding of how we got here. Um, but the Bible tells us in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And first he did that, but then he made us. He made the earth for us. His intention always was about making us. And so we first, as humans, need to figure out what, what this idea, who does God say that I am? What are we here for? If we're going to understand ourselves in, in light of ourselves, we're going to be making a mess of life. And that's what goes on in our culture a lot these days. See, um, God is, is creator of all things. He created the, the, the planet. He is the uncaused cause of all things. He is the eternal creator. And, um, he made the plants and, and the animals and, and, um, we are to have dominion over them. We read in the rest of that verse about the fish and, and all the birds and all the animals along the, uh, in, in the world. Naturalism makes us lower create it's, it's it makes us lower creation but humans human is is knowing your place 
in this uh, world. Being human differentiates us from being an animal. Um, uh, it, see, if we don't get that God made us, then we're going to have a couple of errors. Number one, the error is we're going to elevate ourselves to the point of God, that we are the center of the universe. Um, you have new age religions that talk about the real key to spirituality is discovering you are God. Um, uh, we, we just see it, that, that man is his own authority. We hold our own truths. Um, and, and so we elevate ourselves to God. I think that's kind of what happened in the fall we're going to be looking at soon. But uh, if you eat this, you'll surely know like God does. You're going to be like God. Or the second thing that we do is we push mankind down, uh, that we're no better than the animals. I mean, if we just evolved from the earth, all these other animals are just in that evolutionary process too. And, and they may be superior to us one day. The head of the People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, or PETA, you've heard of, uh, said this a few years ago, a pig is a dog as a rat is a boy. So what, what they were saying is basically a pig is a dog as a rat is a boy. If you're driving down the street and you see a pig, a dog, a rat, and a boy, whoever your car hits, it's all the same difference. If you hit a, a boy, it's the same as hitting a rat on the road. See, it lowers us to the animal level. And, and so here's the thing. We're not gods and we're not animals. God tells us we were created by him in his image. Um, God speaks creation into existence, but to us, he speaks to us. He breathes life into us. See, first God made us and then made us in his image. Verse 27, it says this. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. This is what's called the, the, the Imago Dei. Uh, Latin, you know, religious people love Latin. Anyway, this is foundation, foundational to our identity, that our identity cannot be achieved by us. We cannot do something to achieve identity. And that's, that's a big issue. Because we, if we think our identity is based on our success, well, guess what? Everyone will fail. Does that mean you're worthless if you fail? Um, every one of us, we think, well, it, my health, my physical, my physique, my appearance, my looks, that's my identity. Well, people get sick. People get injured. What then? Are you no longer of value? Um, you, we think about happiness. I'm, I am, my identity is my own happiness. Whatever makes you happy, so be it. Well, the reality is, is all of us will experience pain and, and hurt in our lives. Does that make our identity like lower than other people because we're not as happy? Is your, if your identity is, is as a parent, well, you know what? Kids leave. It's designed that way. Hopefully they, they uh, leave and, and go and develop their own families. See, your identity is not in what you can achieve. Uh, that's why we have these identity crisis, these seven-year itches in marriage. We, we think identity is achieved instead of received. When we realize that we are created in God's image, we have an identity. See, when I became a follower of Jesus, I mean, I, up to that point, because I had lost my biological father, there was lots of questioning in my life. What am I here? Was my dad proud of me? Why did this happen? Why was I raised by a single mom? Am I, am I lovable? Am I meaningful in this life? And you have all those kinds of questions. But as I became a Christian, I, I had a, a new identity, a new place in this world and in this life. And my identity is secure. Our roles in life may change. You may change jobs or careers or, or something like that, but your identity is secure because you have an identity given to you by God. It's unchanging. And uh, so it, this says in the image of God, it's kind of like this idea that we reflect God. That's, that's what it means. It means like we're a mirror to God. Jesus is the best example of that. Uh, it says in 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, that Christ is the image of God. It says in Colossians 1.15 that he is the image of the invisible God. 
Uh, and in John 14, 9, it says, Jesus said this, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. So here's the big idea. When you see Jesus, he was perfectly reflecting um, God. You, you perfectly see God in the universe through the person of Jesus. God tells us not to make graven images. Why? Because we are his image barrier, uh, bearers. So go back to this question. Why are we supposed to love? Why are we supposed to forgive? Why are we supposed to be generous? Why are we to serve others? Well, those are, those are huge questions. Why? You know why? Because we were made in the image of God. God designed us. He made us. We, there's intrinsic value because God made us. See, if we don't have God, if God is not the one that created us, why is there intrinsic value? There's plenty of humans on this earth. Why do we shut down the world because we're trying to because human life is precious? Why is human life precious? Because God made human life. And so uh, we are to, to live that out. God created us. He made us. He made us in his image. And the third thing is that God made us what? According to verse 27. Male and female, he created them. Now, I'm, this may get a little controversial in, in today's culture, but again, this is one of the reasons why we need to go back to Genesis to look at what God says about his purpose and what he did. Before all things, God existed. He, cre he created the heavens and earth. He designed it for us to inhabit. He made us in his image and what does that image reflect? It, re it means we, we reflect who he is. And specifically, he made us male and female. He made us uh, fixed binary gender categories. He, this is the ancient text. This is the Bible saying this. And so um, our culture has a big issue with what the Bible says. This isn't misogynistic religious stuff. This is what we believe. The Bible is the revelation of God that God says, you have been designed male and female. Well, first of all, it's observable. It's science. Male, female. There's, there's two uh, types of humans. And, and so everything God says, the world tries to tear down. If you just think about this for a second, uh, if we even suggest or question any kind of contradiction of what the world says, they call us evil. Let me give an example. If you believe in creation, you're anti-science. Uh, if you believe that man was created instead of evolved, you know, that, that somehow you, you're, you're anti-science, that, that don't you understand that, that we've evolved, that we're equal to the animals, but every human is precious. Or, or truth. Well, if we say there's absolute truth, um, we're narrow-minded, we're bigoted, we're truth is relative. Don't you know that? There is no truth, and we say, declare that absolutely. Um, identity of humans. If we say that identity is, is because of God's image upon us, our purpose, they, they, no, no, no. It's, it's more based on skin color, social classes, our sexuality. Those are the important things. Okay, let's talk about, you know, sexuality and, and gender. God created us male and female. Um, we are, it, that's just cis, cisgendered bigotry. And when we talk about marriage between a man and a woman, um, you know, our culture says, no, there shouldn't be limits to it. You could have polyamorous relationships. You can have same sex relationships. You can't help who you love. So every truth that God teaches, the world contradicts. So God created us binary as male and female. And, and that's under assault in our culture. I don't want to spend too much time on here, but, but there's three things. There's sex, gender, and sexuality. Sex is our biological or physiological creation. Okay, that's, it's in our chromosomes. 
if we're male or female. There is not another set of chromosomes that tell us we're something else. Then gender. Gender is something that we've created. This is how you see yourself. And then sexuality is who you are or what you're attracted to. So in the world, I mean, in the word of God, sex is fixed and binary, male and female. Um, and so you have two categories and gender is fixed and binary, meaning male and female, men are masculine, female are, are feminine. And then sexuality is fixed. It's for marriage between a man and a woman in the context of marriage alone, not outside of marriage. So here's the thing. Don't get me wrong. Uh, sexuality has been a struggle for mankind from the very beginning. I, I saw this funny um, uh, meme. I, th I think it was by uh, uh, the Babylon Bee. It said, uh, study just discovers that um, uh, most men or all men would eat fruit if, get, if handed to them by a naked woman. Um, you know, that, that's just the reality is, is sexuality is, since the fall has been, you know, there's these cravings and desires and it's been a mess. And, and the reality is, is sometimes, uh, these things have gotten all messed up and confused and abused and, and, uh, but either way, uh, the, what's going on in our culture with genders? It's, it's, it's got to break our heart. It's got to challenge our hearts. But how do we deal with this with, with right minds? Because it seems like people have lost their minds. Because um, sex and gender and, and sexuality are all fluid in our culture these days. There, is, there are no clear boundaries. There are no clear lines and, and there's confusion. And, and so what are we going to get? Confusion begets more confusion. And you know what? Here's the, here's the issue. And, and I don't want to be sounding like I'm just some kind of crazy preacher preaching against people's lifestyles. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying there are painful reasons why people are confused regarding sex, gender, and sexuality. A lot of times it's, it's trauma. Trauma, if, if you've been sexually assaulted or sexually abused, uh, it's very confusing about your body and how you view yourself and who you're attracted to and, and those kinds of things. Um, if a dad has abused his, his uh, uh, masculinity and his strength to harm instead of heal and protect, if they've been overbearing and domineering and mean-spirited and violent, um, see, male strength is designed to protect, not, um, to, to abuse. And so that's happened in our culture and it's been going on for, for millennia. I mean, it's just, it's been going on forever, but, um, even today, I mean, we're creating more confusion because there's no clarity on what, what really, how do you define all this? You know, there, there used to be a common agreement on, on definition, but that is thrown out. Now we're giving sex education to six-year-olds in kindergarten. And you know what? Six-year-olds are not interested in sexuality. The only reason they might be interested in sexuality is because they've been groomed or, um, or being groomed or abused right now. Or they're confused by things they're witnessing and seeing. And they need honest truth and clarity on what's going on. The second, another reason why um, some of this confusion is going on in our culture is, is pornography, honestly, is people have discovered you can make money off of sexuality. And so um, pornography has become normative in our culture. You know, when I, when I grew up, um, young boys had to go looking, searching uh, for uh, pictures and things like that. And, and they were always at the grocery store or the drug stores behind, you know, little plastic and all this kind of stuff. Um, but nowadays you had to go looking for it, but now it comes looking for you. Technology is popping up on your screens all the time saying, come here, enticing you. Um, it's consuming us. We've lost all, uh, boundaries on sexuality. There's all kinds of confusion. When you're a young person with the hormones raging and, and stuff like that, it gets, becomes a mess. Saying all that, the Bible is very clear. Male and female, we were made in the likeness of God. But Tweed, you need to love people. 
I do love people. I, you know, I'm never going to stand up and try to condemn a person that's, that's from my perspective, been wounded and confused and, and trying to live, make their way in this world. I'm here to say, um, I think it's more important to know that the God who made you wants the best for you. And I believe this is what God wants and, and has provided for us. He's created us in a certain way. Now, why are we struggling? I mean, just think about this. Um, the stuff that's going on today, how many decisions did you make when you were 20, you know, your teens and 20s that you regret now? Well, that's what we're doing. We're embracing that. A, a child says, well, I want to be a girl or I want to be a boy, you know, and so we just let them, we even start, you know, giving them medications, hormone treatments at early ages because the child says they are, well, kids also want to be astronauts and, you know, we don't send them to space just because they want to do that. So anyway, um, the reality is God has created us male and female. And I know that's a difficult thing in today's culture and how to deal with that and how to maneuver that. But people, we cannot just go with the flow and deny. And, and I'm going to get to why this is so important. But um, anyway, we are made in God's image as male and female. We're equal. Male and females are equal. We don't have to fight to be equal. I just can't, I can't go here because my time is getting short. Uh, but the whole males in sports, in female sports things, uh, people who were uh, born and raised as a male are now identifying as female competing against biological females is just not right. But so anyway, back to the, the big thing, the big point. You know, when you buy something, you get a manual. It's, it's like the, the description of how to operate this right. In fact, when you get Pop-Tarts, it tells you, uh, unwrap the package, put it in the toaster. You know, all these things, it's like, oh, you have to tell me to unwrap it? Yes, because people, given to themselves, will just throw the whole thing into the toaster oven and set their house on fire. It's happened before. So anyway... We need an operator's manual. So um, the reality is, is we need to know operator's manual was designed by the engineers or the people that are telling you how to use it. God made us. God made this planet. God made us in his image. God made us male and female. We need to live according to his divine design. Here's uh, human life flourishing when we follow his design. But when we follow something opposed to God's design, it breaks down. It messes up. And so um, uh, let's get to this last point because th this, this is uh, really important here. We re read in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28 through 31, that God blessed them. He blesses us. God blesses us. So he created us. He makes us in his image. He made us male and female, and he blessed us. He blesses us. See, there's the key to life right now is God's blessing. He designed us, and he blesses us. And he said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. That, what is that? That is create culture, build cities, make businesses, harness the raw resources of this world that God made for our benefit. Um, it doesn't mean to be bad stewards, to destroy our environment, to abuse it, to, you know, we're, but we are the ones to subdue it. We are to utilize the resources of this, this earth to exercise dominion. Why? For mankind. Because human life is good and flourishing, um, and human life flourishes, and, and, and our lives matter to God. It goes on and says, rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and every other living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food and to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground. Everything that has breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw that all he made, uh, that he had made, and it was very good. There was an evening and there was a morning, the sixth 
day. Um, so God is God and he's a good God and he likes to bless. The language of blessing is throughout the Bible. Um, it appears 400 times in the Bible, 80 times in the book of Genesis. Genesis mentions God's blessings more than any other book in the Bible. So when we follow God's design, our lives flourish and are blessed. Life happens. Um, no reset in our culture, in our world, can ever make a better plan than God's plan. And that's important. We live in a world where... Uh, uh, children are an inconvenience. They're an expense. They just burden the, the, uh, uh, the climate and all those kinds of things. But the reality is, is children matter to God. He said, multiply. That means large families. It's okay. You know, this world, while we say, oh, our resources are so tapped, they've been trying to control population from the very beginning. They're opposed to what God says to populate this earth. God knows the right time that this earth is going to end. And so let me just tell you this. You know, we closed down the, the, the world because human life mattered. The leading cause of death last year was not COVID. It was abortion. The leading cause of death the year before was not COVID. It was abortion. And so this is important. These are things that God says. Children, family, men and women, marriage, uh, in the image of God and how we treat each other, how we live in this world to subdue it and have dominion, not to be harsh rulers and abusers of, of an environment, but to bless this world. That's what salvation is. Sin came in, the curse came into this world, and we are to be a part of seeing the curse reversed. We were fearfully and wonderfully made. We are knit together in, in our mother's womb by God. So how do we get blessings from God? We obey. How do we get cursings? We disobey. And so what does God say? Honor him in our marriage. Honor him in our parenting. Honor him in our sexuality. Honor him in our work ethic. Honor him in our attitudes and in our family and how we treat people. Honor him with our money. See, that's how we need to proceed. Let's go on. Thus, in, in chapter 2, verse 1, thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work and he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. So we see God rested um, from his work. God did all the work. He's the one that needs resting, uh, uh, to rest. But I mean, he's all powerful. So did he need the rest? No, he was, he was revealing to us that as men and women on this earth, we need to have a cycle that understands that God created us, that we work, um, six days and then we rest one, you know, uh, we decided, hey, we couldn't decide whether it was the first day of the week or the Sabbath day of the week to rest. So we just took them both off. That's how we have a five-day work week. But um, let me just conclude with this. Why does creation matter and atheistic evolution make no sense? Let me just kind of wrap up a couple of these thoughts uh, as we conclude. Um, you know, atheistic evolution uh, promotes racism. Charles Darwin's original work in 1859 was called The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of the Favored Races in the Struggle of Life. See, the whole evolution was, was viewed as how do we um, keep the, the good people alive? How do, how do they survive? It's the preservation of the favored people. You know, the, the problem with, with evolution, uh, atheistic evolution is nothing made everything. Um, chaos made order. The world is just filled with design, but there's no designer for this. It just happens. 
Um, the impersonal made the personal. We are personal beings. We, we die when we're not in relationship and connection with others. Uh, the unintelligent made the intelligent. It just doesn't make, you know, the reality is, is, is atheistic evolution involves faith as well. I mentioned that last week. Um, atheistic el- evolution is biased. There's, there's a reason why they can't acknowledge God. While many scientists, um, or science was founded by Christians, but many scientists in modern days are discovering God because of their studies, but some are unwilling. They're just biased. So let me close with this. Let me kind of just wrap up this, this idea that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and that he made us in his image Male and female he made us so that we might uh, multiply and, and, and subdue this earth to honor him. And um, uh, um, ultimately rest from our work. Uh, here, here, let me just outline it this way. God made this planet as a gift for you and me. And God made you fearfully and wonderfully in your mother's womb. He designed this earth for you. And he has a purpose for you in this earth. He loves to bless. And we, through our own choices and sin, have brought the curse on ourselves and on this planet. God came into a cursed world and get, to give it life, to re, give us rebirth, to give us purpose again, to understand that we are called to relationship with God, not in our own works. We cannot be our own gods to ourselves. You come from God. You are here for God. And you are going to ultimately return to God. All of us. The study of Genesis is so important. It's such a foundation for all that we do. Are you today just kind of confused and, and, and going along? Well, God has the plan from the very beginning. And it's, this world is not going to be destroyed until God says this is the end of things. You were made for a purpose. God has a plan. He wants to meet you here today. Let's, let's thank the Lord for his word today. Lord, we just thank you for this day. We pray that you would continue to teach us through the book of Genesis. Lord, for each person that watched today, and, and um, I pray that your spirit would speak to their hearts. Those that do not yet know you, but are, are in a journey of, of discovering you, Lord, I pray that you would um, just work in their hearts, Lord. For those that are following you and going through difficult challenges and struggles, Lord, just remind us that you are a good God who blesses. Help us to follow your design for our lives. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good to see you, friends. We'll see you next week.